This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. So Mary Magdalene begins her ministry, tells her story, and then comes, if you will, this confirmation from Jesus. And that evening, while the disciples were hiding in fear, Jesus appears to them in this room that's all locked up. Now the question is, why were they hiding? The answer, uh, not why, we know why they were hiding. They were hiding in fear, but where were they hiding? This question comes up every once in a while. And I want you to think about it. I'm just going to give you a couple of ideas on this. It's doubtful that they had returned to the place where they had shared the Passover communion with Jesus. A lot of people say, oh, they were in the upper room. No. Why would they have gone back there? You see, Judas, remember, had betrayed Jesus. And, and them, by betraying Jesus, Judas had betrayed them also. And uh, he had been with them, so he knew where they had been. And so he, they probably would assume that he had told the authorities and so at some point, so they probably would not have returned there. So they're probably not in that room where, the, where, the, where Jesus had had communion with them. It may have been at John's house. After all, John in chapter 19, we saw this a couple of weeks ago, uh, when Jesus, John 19, 26 and 27, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, well, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So they may have been at John's home. I mean, we could assume that from that statement. It's been suggested that they were at the home, and I kind of tend to agree with this one, uh, that they were at the home of Mary and Martha in Bethany. Remember Lazarus, where, where Jesus raised Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead? Mary, remember, loved to sit at Jesus' feet, and, but she's not mentioned as being at the cross. She's not one of the Marys that is at the cross. And remember that the religious authorities were also seeking to kill Lazarus. Remember we studied, when we studied about Lazarus, it said that from that point on, they sought to kill Lazarus. So they were trying to kill Lazarus after he was raised from the dead by Jesus. So maybe the disciples were hiding together with this family. Maybe they were back in Bethany. The point is, they were hiding behind locked doors. And Jesus appeared to them in that room. And he does four things. Four things happen when Jesus appears to the disciples. Number one, he gives them his peace. By the way, these are four things that God does in your life. He gives them his peace. Secondly, he confirms his presence. He says, it's me. He shows them his hands. He shows them his side. He confirms that it's really him. And then he gives them his power. He gives them the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit becomes very real to them at that point. The presence of God in their lives like they had never experienced before. And you have that also as a believer, as a Christian. You have Holy Spirit in your life. He gives them his power to do two things. Number one, to do his will and to minister. To do his will and to minister. And then the fourth thing is he gives them his purpose. He gives them purpose. This is what you're to do now. Now that you know, now that you know that I'm alive, now that you've gone through this, now it's all coming together. Now you recall all of those things that I said to you before. Now it's beginning to make sense. Now I want you to fulfill your purpose. Why I've called you. Why I told you these things. Why I've given you this instruction. The problem with so many of us today is that we know the why, we just don't do it. We've been given the instruction. The word is very clear to us. It's been given to us. You have the word of God. The disciples didn't even have that. They didn't have the, the printed word of God available to them where they could just study God and take the teaching and take the truth and apply it in their lives and, and use it. And imagine what the disciples could have done with the written word of God. And so they started writing letters and writing you know, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's how the Bible came around. So we didn't have, they didn't have that at that time, but you do. So you have this truth and you are to, you have this purpose, you are to fulfill this. Now, something happens that radically changes the logical skeptic of the group, Thomas. For, Tom, for some reason, Thomas wasn't there that evening. And when he shows up uh, later, uh, assuming that's how it all happens, since they were all in hiding, uh, they were, they, they, the, all of the other disciples were overwhelmed with what had happened, and they start telling Thomas what had happened. They're just overwhelmed. 
And they overwhelmed Thomas. I mean, Tom, you are not going to believe Jesus. We were in this locker room, and Jesus showed up, and he gave us peace. And he told us what we we're supposed to be doing. And, just, and Thomas said, whoa, whoa, now, hold on, time, time out. He says, guys, I think you've been in the wacky juice. Uh, because this, I, I, I'm not believing that. I'm not buying that. Unless I see Jesus myself. I'm not going to believe that. Come on. I think you guys, there's something, I think maybe you, maybe you believe that you saw him, but I'm not sure that you really did. I think maybe it's just, you know, all this fear and being locked up in this room and lack of oxygen is getting to you. I love this about Thomas. I'll be honest. I, I love that he was such a skeptic. Maybe because I can identify with him. Because I also am a real skeptic. I'll just be honest with you. I am a Christian skeptic, but nevertheless, I am a skeptic. I don't buy into all of the miraculous, sensational happenings that people say happen. I know that some of it does happen. And I know that some of what people say is true. But I think a lot of people are just full of baloney. And a lot of what they say, oh, you know, it's just amazing. And we, and you know, and I know that he was a man of God because he walked on water. Sorry, not by him. And he went and he raised several people from the dead. I hear the stories of that all the time. And it happened in Haiti. Somebody raised somebody from the dead. I, you know, I'm not buying it. Sorry. I'm a skeptic. I'm a Christian skeptic. You know, I'm just, I'm just not going to buy all that stuff. And I'll be honest with you, if you buy into it, I think you're nuts. You know, because it's just, you know, let's be honest with you. Some of that miraculous stuff is just weird. People, just, I think people are just goofy. And uh, uh, now I do believe some of it because either I trust the source or I have some sort of evidence to confirm it. And I know that God does miraculous things. I've seen that in my own life. I've seen God do miraculous things. So I do believe, but I am a skeptic. So I don't blame Thomas. And frankly, I think we all need to be a little bit more skeptical about some of the things that we see in here. By the way, I... I will say that now that we are close, closer and closer and closer to the end times, we're going to see a lot more miraculous stuff. You know, because there's this spiritual battle going on, and I really do believe we're going to see more uh, miraculous evidence of God's presence. And so that's not going to surprise me. But here's the beautiful part about this story. Jesus didn't chastise or reprimand Thomas for doubting. Not at all. Jesus made it a point made it a point to confirm the truth to him. The Bible says that eight days later, eight days later, Jesus showed up and, and, and shows himself to Thomas. Now, think about that. It wasn't right away. Thomas said, okay, unless I see him and touch his hands, you know, I'm not going to believe. And poof, there's Jesus. And so, okay, time to believe. Uh -huh. No, it was eight days later. Thomas struggled with that, with what the disciples had been telling him and the disciples were saying was true. For eight days, Thomas is struggling with that. I can't, I just can't buy that. I don't believe it, guys. I'm sorry. And Thomas is struggling with that for eight days. The rest of the disciples had seen it. They were convinced, but Thomas just couldn't buy it. And for eight days, he was struggling. That's one of the reasons that I tell you that when you think you know what God's will is, let him confirm it in his own time. He's not going to confirm it some, you know, right away. Sometimes he will. But more than likely, it's not going to be, there's not going to be an immediate confirmation. When you think you know what God's will is, let God confirm it. Let him show up. Let him reveal himself. Let him confirm his will. If you think God has called you to do something, let God confirm it. He did that with Thomas, but it took him more than a week. So Thomas struggles with it for several days. And I want you to see that God didn't discipline Thomas for doubting. Doubting isn't a sin. Doubting is waiting for confirmation. Did you get that? Doubting isn't a sin. Doubting is waiting for confirmation. It's okay. It's okay. But here's the key to it. Watch for the confirmation. Watch for it. If you're having doubts about what it is that God wants you to do, wait, but watch. Because at some point, not immediately, it was eight days later for Thomas, at some point God's going to show up and confirm his will <coughs> in your life. It's going to take some time, but he will show up. 
He wants you to be sold out to his will. God wants you to be sold out to his will. And he will confirm that so that there is no more doubt about it as far as you're concerned. I, in my own life, that I would have never believed that God would call me to teach. That just did not make sense. I mean, you're looking at a guy who crammed four years of college into 13 years. <laughs> just not that smart. And, uh, uh, you know, I, and, I, and I know that I'm not that smart. And I, and I appreciate the fact that God understands that and doesn't give me too great of a task. And gives me people who are, who are not very smart either that I can teach. <laughs> that didn't come out right. Um, but my point is that, you know, God will confirm. When he calls you, he confirms that the Bible says, faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. In other words, he will do what he called you to do. You're just the vessel. He's the one that's inside the vessel. He's the one that, that is what the vessel contains. So uh, you are a vessel that contains the presence of God. And by the way, uh, I know that we don't, we, we've got to hurry up here, but uh, he's going to do it differently for every one of us. When God confirms his will, he confirms it differently for every one of us. He confirmed it. He's not going to show up like he did with Thomas. He didn't do that with the other disciples and say, here, you know, uh, you're doubting. Okay, here I am. You know, put your hand at my side. He showed them that. He confirmed his who he was. But he doesn't do it the same way for everybody. And he's going to do it differently for your life. I'm going to stop here because we're out of time. Uh, but uh, we'll pick up with this next Sunday. And then next Sunday, we'll uh, also get into uh, uh, chapter 21. Pretty amazing things that, that happen and that, that are relevant to our life. And so I'm excited about New York again. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be the On behalf of Dan.